Welcome to Inside Scoop with Sean Emery. Every week we are examining something new, bringing you closer to companies, sectors, and themes. This recording should not be construed as a substitute for personalized individual advice from Avery and Company or any guests on the show. This is for educational purposes only and not intended to make an offer or solicitation for any companies or securities mentioned. With that, let's get on with the episode. All right, we are here with Matthew Canterman. Welcome to Inside Scoop. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. You're at Round Hill Investments now. Prior to that, you know, Bloomberg, and I'll let you, you know, talk about your whole career. But uh, in general, generative AI is a topic uh, of du jour, topic of discussion. You guys have built out, you know, an active ETF, Chat, a uh, great name. We were just talking about that. And really everything around generative AI. Today, we want to focus on really distilling, you know, what's, what's, hype and what's real, you know, where some of the low hanging fruit in this space kind of lies, uh, where some of the value will accrue, the framework, how you guys are thinking about it. You know, we've had de- uh, different podcast episodes here really around trying to distill some of this. Um, and, you know, welcome to Inside Scoop, I guess, you know, to start off, I think, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Round Hill, and, you know, anecdotes on on that chat, uh, GPT, I guess, uh, chat, uh, generative AI ETF you're building. Yeah, so I'm Matthew Canterman. I'm the director of research at Roundhill Investments. Uh, we are a ETF issuer, registered investment advisor. We focus mostly on thematic ETFs. So the first ETF the fund launched in in 2018, uh, 2019, excuse me, was was Video Games Nerd. Uh, the biggest fund in the portfolio is the Metaverse ETF ticker METV. That was the first Metaverse ETF and is the largest in the world. Uh, and and now we have Chat, which is our generative AI ETF. All in, we have about 750 million dollars of assets under management. Uh, so, you know, relatively young firm, but really innovative and really kind of pushes these new thematic, uh, you know, broadly interactive TMT themes. Really, we're all about giving investors the ability to make decisions and, and express their opinions in differentiated ways that they couldn't before. Uh, myself, prior to working at Roundhill, I, I worked with Matthew Ball. Uh, he's very known in the metaverse sphere for about, you know, about a year as director of research at his firm. Prior to that, I was at Bloomberg Intelligence, which is the research arm of Bloomberg. Uh, both in New York and Hong Kong. I, I covered a broad range of TMT companies there throughout my career. So very well versed broadly across the interactive TMT space. Yeah, no, um, definitely well regarded yourself. The, you know, we have our opinions on generative AI and and what it all means. Um, you guys are doing something pretty interesting there. And just, you know, let's just really kick it off this episode with, you know, what are some of maybe your framework? How about, how about that? Let's just start at the t- uh, top down and just how are you framing you know, let's say the opportunity, the landmines that potentially exist here. Um, we just saw like a hundred million dollar raise from, you know, a group that, you know, has been around for, you know, call it a couple of weeks. I'm sure there's more, you know, behind that story, but um, in general, there, there's plenty of hype here. So just frame for us, you know, what you're seeing, how you're framing this opportunity. Yeah. So we look at generative AI, we, you know, we look at kind of four buckets of companies. We don't think that traditional sectors and all the traditional groupings really are relevant in modern technology in general, specifically here. So the four buckets of companies, the four categories that we look at are uh, AI infrastructure, which so that's your semiconductors, your networking, your servers, et cetera. We look at AI platforms. Those are the cloud platforms on which other developers can build third-party generative AI applications. And then we look at uh, consumer and enterprise generative AI software companies. So those are the the four types of companies that we narrow our focus on. The reason that we've narrowed there is because we believe those are the types of companies today that are going to accrue the most value from generative AI. Over a decade, pretty much every company in the world will benefit to some degree from generative AI, right? There's this massive productivity boost that's likely to come from AI in general, particularly generative AI. Goldman Sachs estimates that at $7 trillion dollars of GDP in a decade. McKinsey just came out and said over 4 trillion a year. So whatever number you stick on it, there's this massive productivity boost that's going to come from generative AI in particular, but AI overall. Uh, So we we narrow our focus there to separate out the beneficiaries from the companies that are really driving the development of this technology and going to be the key players in its implementation and commercialization across the global economy. Got it. Yes. We have a a similar framework in terms of how we're thinking about it as well. Now, a lot of discussions really around, you know, how, you know, who's going to be the winner here and not like singular winner, but, you know, broadly speaking. And, you know, when you think of some of the, the players specifically on the infrastructure layer, you know, kind of distill some of 
what we're seeing, you know, with the NVIDIAs, again, none of this is, you know, investment advice and whether to buy these securities or sell these securities, more just conversation really around them. But, you know, you take a company like NVIDIA or some of the other chips and semiconductors where, you know, on one side, and then you have, you know, some of the hyperscalers on the other side where they're already making efforts to, you know, build their own chips, you know, five, seven, 10 years from now, where are they? Uh, but you think of generative AI and just AI more broadly, how do you distill that? You know, just really f- looking at who's leading the, the, the categories today. Again, NVIDIA is getting all the hype around it uh, for many good reasons, but also some of the ones that have the biggest resources in terms of dollars, but also data, um, how, where they'll be you know, in five, seven, 10 years from now, and potentially you know, procuring a lot of their own um, infrastructure uh, themselves in-house. And we've seen that. How do you think about you know, those two uh, you know, counterbalancing? Yeah, we spent a lot of time within NVIDIA, which is the largest holding in chat, and thinking about the infrastructure. And you can read our research on this at blog.roundhillinvestments.com. There's your plug. Um, but NVIDIA probably doesn't have real material competition for at least two years. Um, and we say that because, yes, AMD has a chip coming out, sampling in the third quarter, launching in the fourth quarter. They announced that yesterday. We recorded this on June 14th. You know, Broadcom has a networking chip coming out at the same time. Others have pieces coming. But it's not just about putting the pieces together. It's also the performance trade-off. What we know, particularly about training large language models and training generative AI, performance matters a lot. And what we don't know yet, but what's inferred is that the performance drop-off from a custom build or a piecemeal by piecemeal build, which the cloud guys like to do in their end state, is probably going to degrade their their performance to a degree where they, they, they won't make that decision just yet. Now, in five years, yes, maybe they will start doing that themselves or they'll go to a fully custom solution, someone like Marvell that can put that together on, on all ASICs, right? Eventually, there will be ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. For those that don't know tech lingo, these are chips that are designed to do one thing, whereas a CPU or a GPU are designed to, t- to do you know multiple things. GPUs are more specific than CPUs, but that's just kind of how they work. So the more specific a chip is, is designed to do one thing, it's going to be better at that. But the question is, can you put that together in a system that is going to have the same or comparable performance or not have the performance degradation uh, to a degree where the cost uh, the cost savings makes sense? So eventually the cloud guys will get to the point of doing it themselves with ASICs, white box, et cetera. We're just not there yet. And you saw this in, you know, for example, cloud networking. Um, you know, there were several years when the clouds were first being built that Cisco was still the default standard, even though you had to deal with their software and they were, you know, they were you were locked into it because the performance drop off to go to white box or to go to a startup like Arista was 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 quite large but Arista got really good white box got really good over the course of a few years now Arista's data center hyperscale uh, networking sales i think are larger than Cisco so you know eventually there will be you know uh you know smaller players that target specific segments of the market specific chips that are made for specific features and eventually that will become a part of the market but at that point you know, NVIDIA is trailing 12-month data center revenue is about $15.5 million. The TAM, depending on who you ask, for data center GPU systems, accelerated compute systems, is anywhere between $150 and $300 billion long term. So if we're five years out and NVIDIA is growing 40% a year on data center, you know, they're going to be significantly larger than they are today. So even if their market share goes from 80% to 50%, they're still going to grow their sales several times over over the next few years in data center. And so that's the way we think about it. So even if there is competition, we think that validates NVIDIA's strategy and we think it validates their data center, uh, their data center outlook. And competition coming in means that the market is growing as quickly as we think it will. Got it. Makes sense. Um, you know, speaking of around cost, again, around where value accrues, I think, um, I think what we're witnessing right now, specifically with a lot of these technologies, is, is really the freemium model where we're all kind of getting accustomed to touching and feeling this at no cost. Now, what we do know though, however, is, you know, on the commercial side, commercial use case of these, whether it's, you know, open AI, uh, some of the language learning models on like hugging face or things like that, you know, the cost of these things and just the cost to build out, you know, I think there's estimates around there around open AI and what it would cost to, you know, rebuild what they've uh, essentially built. Um, and those are in the, the billions of dollars uh, to catch up. Now, we know freemium doesn't last forever. We saw that in, you know, the early 2000s where there was freemium models that now are, you know, multi-billion dollar revenue businesses. Um, How do you think about, you know, the cost structure for this? Not only for the consumer, because again, if we're trying to target productivity and, you know, part of the productivity equation is cost, um, 
you know, where does this go? You know, how much does cost curves come down like dramatically enough to, you know, overcome some of the cost burden that I think as these things get embedded into, you know, Firefly at Adobe and some of these others, and then uh, Microsoft's, you know, co-pilot, you know, there's talks of, you know, price potentially increases on like their E7 licenses eventually. Um, how do you think about the cost structure to the end customer where today it feels free, but, you know, maybe in five years, this is more of, um, you know, just a, a strategy to, you know, increase costs across, you know, bundles. So a couple of comments on, on technology and then let's separate consumer from enterprise because they're two different discussions, right? So there's lots of tech terms, training versus inference for large language models. Training is when you're building them and making them, teaching them how to think effectively. Well, they don't really think, but teaching them how to recognize stochastic patterns. Um, that's really compute intensive and that uses a lot of these GPUs and everything. Inference, we're still not sure exactly how expensive that's going to be. There's many people that think that we can do that off of ASICs and do it really a lot cheaper than training. So, you know, for example, there was an, an analysis from Semi-Analysis, which is a great substack if you're into like nerdy, nerdy chip things like I am. And they basically said that if Google were to today run all of their search on GPUs, like uh, for LL, you know, if they changed everything to AI search on, on GPUs, they'd lose the, all of their gross profit. You know, it was just because the, the cost increase of doing that would wipe out all of their profits from search, which is pretty much all of their profit, right? So, um, you know, that's obviously just, you know, that's an example. That's a theory. That's not real. They're not going to do that. But the point being that by the time they actually get to the point where search will be on AI, they will have probably have some sort of ASIC that's a lot cheaper to run on. There's maybe even, you know, they could possibly run it on older large language models that are cheaper and not as big. So for example, Bard runs on uh, Lambda, not Palm. Palm is the much more advanced model and Palm 2, they just announced, right? So there's things they can do to manage the cost structure and keep, you know, keep the price of the consumer down. We're also seeing them experiment with new business models. I mean, search has been boring for a decade. It's been an advertising business, but Bing just came out and, or ChatGPT you can subscribe to. I believe, you know, Microsoft has teased. I'm not sure if it's live yet. You know, you can subscribe for Bing Premium. I think in the end game, you might even have this bifurcation of the market where it's like, hey, if you want the, if you're, if you want the latest and greatest large language model powered search, you subscribe to it and you get that premium model. And then if you just want an advertising free base, you run two generations behind maybe, right? You know, that's, that's an option that could work. And so the subscribers that want the latest and greatest are subsidizing the cost for the people that want the free model. So I think there's a lot of different things that they can do going forwards. We're clearly seeing that people aren't afraid to pay for this stuff with chat GPT. Um, you know, so I, I subscribe to it. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, from the from that side, I think there there is a business case to be had that this can work. And and also remember, search advertising is still growing double digits. So that's you know there's also just a, a natural tailwind to the market overall. Um, on the enterprise side, it's a bit more nuanced because like I don't, I don't think people are going to necessarily charge for generative AI software on its own. It's going to become a feature built in, kind of like Adobe, as you mentioned. Uh, another example of the use case is you know C three AI has has rolled out generative AI and basically. It's just a natural language interface on top of the existing AI platform. And what's great about something like that is every user becomes a power user, right? So in the past, you had to know some data science coding language like Python or whatever to extract insights. You had to know how to interact with the, with the data set to get what you wanted. Now you can go in front of it and say, you know, they work with the government. Where are all the F-35s in the world? And it spits it out of the data set for you. So, you know, there's things that you can do to extract insights and make every user a power user. And that's going to be really powerful for the enterprise, even if you don't directly monetize that. Got it. Got it. Got it. Do you think these are going to be more subscription models or, you know, um, uh, transactional slash, you know, uh, usage models um, long term? I mean, overall, enterprise is shifting to consumption, right? Consumption usage based pricing. And I think when you're starting to think about the concept of making every user a power user, that's really, that, you know, that's good for business, right? Because more people using it, more of the time, more consumption, more vCPU hours, right? That's going to lead to more revenue. So I think that's the model that people want. Um, but, you know, we're also probably going to see Microsoft bundle, you know, it'd be really funny if they brought back Clippy as like a generative AI assistant, right? You know, sure. built into the office suite, that would also be kind of cool and funny, right? So, you know, nice nostalgia, little, you know, uh, callback, but no, I, so I think to some degree, it'll be a retention tool. To some degree, it will open up new revenue. Yeah. It, it, for, for one, though, you know, when it goes to the consumption model, you know, we saw um, C3 AI move to a consumption model here. Uh, you know, Snowflake is known for that. Um, and one thing or like one aspect of it, at least, you know, historically, when people invested in, you know, some of these software enabled tech, um, it was these, you know, reoccurring models of which were a little bit less susceptible to, you know, cyclical turns. Um, 
And this could, I mean, in theory, you know, totally transform, you know, potentially the multiple people are willing to pay for them. Again, there's a long way until we're even at, maybe even having that discussion. Um, but how do you like mentally think about that where, you know, this seems much more like a potential consumption model, at least for the enterprise. Um, and, you know, what that ultimately means for the value of these assets. And again, I say Snowflake as a consumption model, but yet this thing's still trading, you know, at many multiples of, uh, you know, sales today. Um, so it's not really showing up necessarily in, um, uh, you know, multiple compression. So maybe that, that kills, uh, you know, the entire, uh, you know, theory there, but how do you think about, you know, consumption versus, you know, software as it relates to value? I hate to be like, it depends on the case, but it does depend it's on true, the case, uh, yeah. right? Because no, if you think about, you know, something like a C3 AI, right? Where it's in going from an ELA where they're paying you a fixed amount, you know, over the life of a contract to consumption based. On, on its surface, doesn't really change the move the needle for me because, you know, how many times are they act is the data scientist who works at their customer base going in? I think what makes it exciting with the shift to consumption is the the natural language generative AI piece that they're adding to it as well, because now you don't need to be a data scientist to use it, right? And so that only works when you can open up the number of seats, you know, by by orders of magnitude with with additional technology, additional effectively a better GUI, right? A, a better user interface, right? So I think from that perspective, like yes, you're losing some of the subscription stability and the premium that people pay for that in the market. But in this case in particular, you're opening up the number of seats that can possibly use it, which I think will more than offset the impact of the subscription decline. And so, you know, I think in this case, it's a good decision and it makes sense having seen what they're doing with the generative layer. There's other businesses, and, and you mentioned maybe Snowflake, for example, where shifting to consumption may not work out as well because, you know, if you're just if you're just swapping seats and you're not driving any additional consumption, you might be missing out on some of the baked in step ups that come with the subscription plan alongside just the valuation premium that people pay for, you know, a pure SaaS business versus a software enabled technology business. Got it. Yeah, let, let's switch to data. How important data is to ultimately, you know, these underlying businesses, you know, from a defensibility standpoint, we think of like companies like Zillow, you know, which controls 60, 70% of all real estate app downloads and engagement. We think of, you know, obviously the metas of the world. Um, and there, there's plenty of others, you know, it could be hyper verticalized and, you know, a smaller market, but a lot of data relative to their peers. Um, how do you think about data? How important is it? You know, how do you define or, or make the distinction that, the, hey, this is, you know, data that is comparatively, you know, better relative to their, their peer set, therefore, you know, much more of a sustainable business um, or category uh, within, you know, AI specifically. I, I mean, data is extremely valuable data. I mean, who said it? Data is the new oil, right? I mean, that's been kind of a catchphrase for a while now, but yeah. when it comes to AI and generative AI in particular, we have large language models now, which, you know, I'll use the chip analogy that I kind of used before. CPUs do everything kind of good, right? That's what CPUs are good at. GPUs do a much smaller set of things really well. And then ASICs do one thing extremely well, right? So large language models are the CPUs. They do lots of things fairly well. So they, you know, they analyze tons and tons of data all across the internet, all across any source you plug into it, and they come up with reasonably good answers. We're going to get to a stage where we're going to have more focused models. You know, industry specific. Bloomberg is rolling out Bloomberg GPT, right? Which is trained on finance specific data, right? So we're going to have these these industry specific models, and I think those are going to be extremely valuable in the next few years. We're just not quite there yet because we're still kind of testing out and phasing out the technology. But someone like Zillow, who has all this real estate data, they'll be able to build up a data set and a model that is trained on all of their data for real estate. That's going to be extremely valuable for that industry in, in extracting insights and being more data driven across the industry, right? The same thing goes for pretty much everything. So we're going to have more of these industry specific, smaller, large language models. I don't know what we're going to call them yet. And then eventually, you know, if, if you believe the technology will eventually get to on device. So we'll basically get to the point where we'll have very small models that can live on your device and handle input output effectively and turn that into, you know, requests that the data set in the cloud can, 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 can understand. Similar to what I described with C3 AI, having that natural language interface in front. That's kind of where we're going. Qualcomm is talking about that and how they're already starting to build that into their chipsets for phones today. So that way in the future, you know, you can have these, these, you know, generative AI models, generative AI technology built into devices themselves at the edge. And I think that's going to be extremely valuable at some point down the road. So, you know, I think over time, as we move away from, you know, large language models doing everything to more industry specific, all these data companies, Shutterstock is a good one, right? With photos, right? You know, Adobe and Creative, maybe even Roblox, right? These companies that have very specific vertical focused data sets 
uh, are going to be able to monetize those and, and build out more of a SaaS business on top of that. You know, I mean, the data set is only so good. It's the application you build on top of that. But assuming that they succeed in building the application on top of that, that's going to be a lucrative business for them eventually. Got it. You know, looking at the portfolio of chat, what are like what um what name in there do you think uh you know it is one that isn't necessarily as um obvious for you know generative AI um you know that stands out into your 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 mind right now? I'll, so I'll give you two. Um, my experience being you know living in Hong Kong for three years, we did have a good good quotient of China in the portfolio, and it's not just Baidu. People you know know Baidu; it's a known commodity in the West, but a company listed in the mainland on the A shares is, is iFlyTech. It's uh, 002230, I believe is the ticker. Um, they're the leader in the Chinese conversational AI market. They rolled out their own large language model, building their own chatbots and other applications around that. So that's a company that's that's well positioned, we think, to move from traditional conversational AI into generative AI and roll that out across the enterprise. So that that's one. Um, the other that I would mention is Duolingo is in the portfolio. And you know people think of that as... I have to do my stupid language training, but when you think about we the computers, here, so was thing. that? I say we've we've owned Duolingo the last couple of years, so. But when you think about the ability for them to now customize learning, customize you know new content, have the have the AI model generate new content for users, that's going to be a huge boon for their business and help reduce their costs on the content generation side. So Duolingo is one as well. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Duolingo Max was their. Uh was their launch around, you know, those topics. We actually, it's a, it's a plug for our show, but we had um, the CFO on here, you know, a year and a half ago when we, when we first started looking at them. Um, so that's interesting if you wanted to learn more specifically about what they're doing, at least then uh, there's a lot since then, um, you know, yeah, those are two very interesting, uh, you know, uh, the average person ha has probably questioned whether Duolingo is actually a threat, uh, like a threat or uh, at a disadvantage to this. But, uh, you know, I think, um, I think, from... there's, I think there's a lot of companies in that boat right now where it's like <clears throat> disrupt or be disrupted, right? They need to disrupt their own business and they need to, <clears throat> excuse me, they need to disrupt their own business and they need to be successful with generative AI and advancing new technology or they will be disrupted. We're seeing this yeah. potentially also in the contact center software space, right? If you look at Five9 and Nice, a few of the peers in that space, you know, on the one hand, it's like the the ROI savings for, con you know, call center customers to, you know, re replace humans with bots is extremely valuable, but who says that, you know, the existing incumbents that do the software piece like nice are going to be the ones that, that sell that. Right. So they need to be first to market and get that out there as quickly as possible and disrupt their own business before someone else does. And yeah. I mean, you saw this with Chegg, right? Chegg got demolished. <laughs> uh, the stock price did because yeah. it seems like people are using chat GPT for homework help instead of Chegg. So, you know, you need, I mean, companies need to be aggressive in thinking about how this is going to disrupt their business, uh, you know, before someone else does. Cool. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, sustainability around all this, you know, the last couple of questions here, which, which is, you know, how do you, you think about the sustainability of these businesses? Again, you know, some of these specifically, probably more on the consumer side are going to be like a flash in the pan, you know, you use it and, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, recreating, you know, it's just, it's just an interface, you know, difference between a couple of them, uh, as opposed to, you know, something inherently, you know, unique about them. Um, and, you know, sometimes that, that's all that matters. And, you know, you build a large base and there's network effects that are involved and, you know, a lot are doing the same thing. But how do you think about sustainability within this category? We've touched on it, I think, across all of the things we've talked about. But if, you know, you're sitting down, you're saying, you know, the company XYZ is, uh, you know, they're doing this, X, Y, uh, you know, infrastructure or, you know, they have the data, uh, management's executing. How do you think about, you know, is this a defendable business uh, longer term? It's everything you said plus IP. Um, you know, I think that you know IP is the most defensible thing in the world, right? If you own the patents on something, that 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 protects it, right? So I'll go back, you know, C three AI again, right? You know, they don't own any of the individual underlying technologies, but they have patents around how they implement it and put the whole system together. And the analogy that that they explained is basically someone has the patent for the airfoil, for the propeller, and and the tail rudder, but they don't have the patent for the airplane. Someone else who filed for the patent for the airplane that puts it all together has the patent for the whole system. And so even if the underlying pieces that go into something are open source and available, only certain companies have the, have the intellectual property on how to put it together and effectively do it and bring it to market as a full stack solution. So that's something that you know, we look for in general as IP as well. Uh, you know, and, and then also, as you mentioned, just user base and ability to scale up really quickly. Obviously, that lends itself to hyperscalers who can do that, right? Um, but even on the software side, it's companies that have 
you know, a, an existing business that we think can be enhanced with generative AI. So they already have a customer base, a recurring revenue stream. I mentioned the contact center software companies or iFly Tech with their conversational AI software, right? These are these are easy upsells or add-ons to the existing customer base. Um, that those are the things that we look for. Got it. Cool. You know, Matthew Canterman, you know, good, great conversation around generative AI. I did want to leave you a second. You know, we've we've touched on, you know, the chat ETF that's out and available today, probably across all platforms or most platforms, let's say. Um, you know, anything you I wanted to leave you on in terms of, you know, how to find out more uh, around, you know, the specific ETF that helps, you know, people invest directly in this category. Uh, it sounds like globally. Um, and, you know, anything you wanted to share around that topic. Yeah. If you have any more questions about our fund, you can go to our website, roundhillinvestments.com. Um, you can get all of the information about the fund there. You can also find, as I mentioned, all of our proprietary research around generative AI. We've done some market sizing uh, estimates and some, 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 some work around the hardware side, the software side. So you can go and check that out. It's all on our website. It's all free. Uh, and I would just mention, you know, just some, some stats about the fund. Like people think, you know, this is a high growth, high tech fund. The fund on, you know, just the average forward ROE as of yesterday was 19.8%. So, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not just a bunch of high beta, high flying tech stocks. We really have tried to be thoughtful about what goes into the portfolio. Uh, and, and so you can go check out the full holdings and all the information again on the website. Smart. Cool. Yeah, no, appreciate you coming on. You know, I've had long discussions with Will uh, Hershey, you know, the last several years, and you guys are doing great things at Roundhill. So congratulations on that. You know, good luck with obviously this launch. I, you know, I don't doubt it's going to be, you know, successful enough. Um, and yeah, I wish you guys best of luck. And, you know, thanks for coming on and, and talking about generative AI today. Thanks. Have a good one.